that's when OJ emerges in the white collared shirt with the stonewashed jeans and they load the bags in and get in the limo and take off. Which we've heard a lot about. Uh, once again, when I was talking about that A&E two-hour special that I saw the other night on the trial, and Bill Curtis made a point there saying this was a unit that Cato Kalin heard three loud thumps from. Well, Cato Kalin at no time in this trial said that he heard three loud thumps from the air conditioning unit. Once again, that was one of Marsha Clark's theories. Uh, she said that. What Cato actually said, and he demonstrated when he was on the stand with the, with the table in front of him, that he heard three loud bumps, sort of like that. Now, I don't know what that could have been. Maybe it was a signal. I have no idea. But he never said that he heard anyone hit this air conditioning unit. That was a theory of Marsha Clark's. Now, let's take a good look at this air conditioning unit. You can see there's some slats here. They face outward. It's head high. So one would think if anyone ran back here in the dark and ran into this uh, unit that they would should, should have sustained some type of bruise, some type of injury. And of course, if they were bloodied and had blood on them, uh, there should have been some fabric or some blood on that unit. Right down here, about four or five feet from this unit is where they found or where they claim to have found uh, the glove. Uh, one very interesting thing about that glove, there was no debris on it, there was a lot more here then than there is now, and one key thing about that glove, when Furman saw it, he said it was still wet, it was thick, we did some experiments with that with experts, and they all told you that there was no possible way, seven hours later after this crime, that that glove could still have, bloody, uh, have blood on it, could still be wet and still be bloody. That was, I think, an experiment that I can't recall now if we really got it into evidence or not, but uh, we know, and the public should know, that that was an experiment that was done, and it proved that that glove should have been dried uh, by that time in the morning. Now, let's go around front again, and I'll show you some more interesting things. One other point I should say, once again, these berries that were here were also at Nicole's house. If someone walked out of that or walked away to the side of her house, and if they went uh, into that Bronco, there should have been some debris, some leaves, some berries. The same should uh, have been detected in my home. I have some very light carpeting, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, if someone ran through here and then went right into my house and went up that carpeting, stepping on these berries, one would think there'd be some trace of that on this very light carpeting. Let's go around front. Did you... Did you discuss with the defendant the earthquake that you thought you felt or the prowler that you thought might be there? Yes, I did. What did you say? I said, OJ, I heard this noise. Uh, I thought something might be back there. Were you this still flash... pretty excited about that? Pardon? Were you still pretty excited and yeah. upset about that? Yes. So I said this flashlight it doesn't work very well. And I need a better one, so I asked the limo driver if he had a flashlight. And he said no, and then I asked uh, O.J., and he said, uh, you go inside and we'll check for one. And then did the defendant go back in the house? Yes. Did you go with him? Yeah, I was behind him. What happened then? Um, went into the house, and uh, then O.J. said, is that the right time? And I was behind him, and I said, yeah, so... Then he had to catch his flight, so I hurried up, got him good going. I said, come on, you got to catch the flight. So then he got in the limo. Now, do you recall talk, Do you recall having a conversation after you told the defendant about the earthquake in which you agreed to both search the, prop the property? Yes. What did he say? Mm. What did he tell you? That he, we check it together. And then what did you do? Oh, we were going to get a flashlight, so we never, I didn't get the flashlight. So I never checked on it again. So you did, not, you did not separate and go and look around the property? No. So now let's get over to 875 South Bundy Drive during that time. We know a few of the neighbors heard the dog barking at about 10.15. And that's very important. Um, one of the neighbors was Pablo Fenvis. Now, Pablo lived on Gretna Green. His back part of the house overlooked the alley that Nicole Brown Simpson's condo was on. So they shared the alley. He was, um, I don't know, a couple hundred feet north of her. Maybe less than that even. 
So he was able to see her condo, not all of it, just a portion of it. But he said, you know, the 10 o'clock news was on for a few minutes. Um, and it was about 10.15 that the dog started just wailing, barking. It was a different kind of bark. You know, it wasn't a, a, a normal bark. You know, it was almost a cry or a howl. Eva Stein lived just north of Nicole's condo. She was the neighbor just north of that. She also testified that she could not sleep. It was about 10.15. The dog was barking. Now, Eva Stein's boyfriend, a Louis Carp, wasn't home at that point. Now, he gets home from LAX at 10.45. He parks in the garage that's on the alley side of his building and then goes out to Bundy to get um, his mail. And this was about 10.45 to 10.50, roughly in there. And he said the Akita was outside and being real aggressive. And it actually started coming towards Lewis. So Lewis backed into his side there and, and closed the gate to protect himself because he said the Akita was, was going off. So there was another local resident that lived a couple of blocks away from Nicole, a Stephen Schwab. He was a dog walker um, in the area. And every night he had a routine. After the Dick Van Dyke show, he would leave to walk his dog. And we're talking just right after the Dick Van Dyke show. Once it ended, he'd throw the leash on the dog and they would take off. Now, he constructed a route, a 30-minute route that would get him back home every night in time to watch the Mary Tyler Moore show, which started at 11. So it was a precise walk. He testified as he approached the corner of Dorothy and Bundy, he came across the Akita, and he noticed the Akita had blood on its paws, blood on its fur, and this was about 10.55, because from the intersection of Dorothy and Bundy, it was only another five minutes or so to get back to Schwab's apartment. So as he headed north on Bundy, the Akita followed him, followed him back to the apartment, Stephen Schwab. But the dog was panting. The dog was panting, and um, I, you know, my wife was there. Why won't Why won't it go? Why won't it go where you're ta where you're taking it? And I said, I don't know, but I can see that the dog is dehydrated. I think you know the best thing to do at this point would be to give it some water, because again, I didn't know at that point how long the dog had been lost. It could have been we could have been weeks for all I know that the dog was was wandering and just happened to arrive in this neighborhood. So I decided to to bring it back to my apartment and give it some water. When you first saw the dog, and when you were walking with the dog on the street, uh, was it well lit where you saw the dog? No, it was not well lit. It was very, it's a very dark corner. When you brought the dog back home, and you were downstairs with the dog, was there more light? Yeah, there was more light. Were you able to observe the dog then more closely, to look at its body, its legs? I saw the dog more closely at that point. And what did you notice, if anything more, about the dog? Well, I noticed, again, that it, was, that it was dirty and that there was blood on the paws. Um, Did you notice at that point, I would, I would say that the, that the blood was dried. Did you notice whether there was any blood on the legs of the dog? There was, the underside of the dog was dirty. And um, again, I noticed the blood on the paws, but I didn't, didn't think that much about it. My dog has come home with a bloody paw sometimes from stepping on glass or a fight with another dog, so I didn't think that much about that, especially being that it was a lost dog. I had no idea what it had been through at that point. So the blood on the paws didn't strike you as something to worry about because you thought it might have stepped on glass? Yeah, except that I uh, further didn't work. I noticed that the dog wasn't hurt in any way. It was, despite that, there was no injury that I could see to the dog. The dog wasn't cut on the paws but I didn't think much more about it, again, because it could have happened, it could have happened much earlier. So you didn't see any obvious cuts on the dog to cause that blood? There, there were no cuts on the dog at that point. There was, it, was not, it itself was not bleeding at that point in any way. And did you see any blood anywhere other than the paws on the dog? Well, it's, again, the dog seemed dirty, especially the underside of the dog, the, the chest of the dog. I don't know myself whether that was was blood or mud or dirt but it was it was the underside of the dog was dirty and the legs and the, the legs again I noticed I noticed the blood and um, I don't remember noticing any any mud particularly on the legs I noticed the blood blood on the legs yeah he came across Stephen Schwab did he came across his other neighbor Sukuru Bostepi 
Now, Sucre volunteered to take the dog because, you know, Stephen Schwab wasn't having any luck with the dog at his place. So they were friends, they were neighbors. So Bostepi said, hey, I'll take the dog. Now, once the Akita was in Bostepi's apartment, it was extremely restless. It, was, it wouldn't stay still. It was frantic. So Bostepi and his wife decided that just before midnight, they'll maybe walk the dog back towards the area where Stephen Schwab found it, which would be the corner of Dorothy and Bundy. When you got out of the apartment building area, did you let the dog go in front of you? Yes. And where did the dog lead you? Uh, south to Bundy. And then where? And then uh, dog passed pass across the street uh, to Bundy. Uh, Cross the street to the other side, and then uh, start to pull me a lot harder than it was before. And then we walk for a while, and then he stopped, turned right, and just stopped. I turned right too. So as you proceeded southbound on Bundy, the dog <coughs> seemed to pull harder and harder. Yes. And then it stopped at some point on the sidewalk. Yes. The point at the s on the sidewalk where it stopped. Um, was there a, a path of any kind? Yes, it was a path to a house. To the house? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 So Sukuru and his wife, Bettany Rasmussen, take the dog for a walk, and they head south on Bundy. Now, according to Sukuru, the dog was pretty much pulling him back south on Bundy, on the side where Nicole's condo was. The dog, the Akita, stops right there in front of the walkway where the Akita lived. And at that point, Sukru and his wife, Bettany, turn and look to the gate, and they see Nicole laying there in a pool of blood. The gate was open. It was dark. Can you describe what else you saw in that area where you saw the woman? There was a lot of blood. I could see only from the street light which comes uh, from my be from behind so it was pretty dark and i have seen only for a quick moment and i changed i mean i just turned around and I never looked at it again if the dog had not stopped where it did would you have looked up the path and seen her no was there any light coming from the house near where you saw her lying? No. <coughs> was there any light coming from the... Excuse me, strike that. If you recall, was there a gate anywhere near where you saw the woman? <coughs> That I don't remember. I haven't seen the gate. I've just looked uh, very low level, uh, exactly where she was li laying. So They run across the street and start knocking on the door of a Elsie Tissaturt, an elderly woman that had, li that had lived there 51 years. I may have pronounced her last name wrong. But anyways, she didn't answer. So... They go to one house north of her and knock on that door where a gentleman lets them call 911. Um, the actual first call, the first two officers to arrive, uh, Officer Risky and an Officer Tessarez, I believe his name is. Uh, I could be pronouncing that wrong. Uh, they get there, but they go to Mrs. Tissaturt's house first because it was a 911 call. She thought somebody was breaking into the home. So the actual call wasn't for the bodies. The, the initial response, you know what I mean? It was actually Elsie calling the cops because she thought somebody was breaking in. So the two officers talk to Sukru and his wife, Bettany, and they point them to the bodies. And um, Officer Risky testified that, you know, they only saw Nicole's body at first, so they walk up the, the grass patch on the south side of the walkway there so they don't ask to not step in any blood or anything 
And, you know, right away, because it was so dark in there, they don't, they don't see Ron Goldman laying there. Um, they eventually do, obviously, but that's where they come across the two bodies. So when asked by Marsha Clark what Bostepi saw when he turned and looked up the walkway, and I quote, I saw a lady laying down full of blood. Now there was another dog walker, a man by the name of Robert Heidstra. His normal route, there was a part of it that he would walk past Bundy, but on the east side of the street, as he was coming southbound on Bundy, he could hear the Akita just going off aggressive. So what what Heidstra does is he turns around, heads back north, and cuts down an alleyway that is parallel and probably about 250 feet away from Nicole's walkway. So he walks through that alleyway and at the point where he is directly across about 250 feet away from Nicole's, uh, he claims to have heard something, maybe even heard the murder. He heard two men arguing. He heard a gate shutting. He heard someone saying, hey, 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 or whoa, 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 something along those lines. And that potentially could have been the the murder happening. So right here is where Robert Heister was walking his dogs and he stopped and he potentially could be the only ear witness to the crime where he heard someone say, hey, 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 and a gate rattling. And this lines up with Nicole's condo right here. So this would be the area. Now, as he gets to the south end of that alley, he makes a left, Heidstra does, and stops at a tree where he turns around and faces westbound and can see the edge of Nicole's alley. And at that point, he claims a white vehicle, SUV vehicle, came out of the alley, made a left heading eastbound, and then made a right on South Bundy. Now, in speculation, that would could have been the Bronco, you know? Um, I don't necessarily think that was the Bronco at that point, just because I don't think OJ would have taken that route, but it's all speculation, right? So according to Hydra's testimony, it was around 10.35 p.m. He heard the two men arguing um, across at Nicole's condo. You know, I've heard people say that maybe what Hydra heard was actually Lewis Carp um, shutting his gate because the Akita was out there barking. But that time is a, is a little off from when, you know, from what Heidstra says. But then again, it's it's all approximate times from these witnesses, right? They can only kind of try to pinpoint when it was. The fact of the matter is there was two bodies slain there around that time. There was a dog barking around that time. I think OJ would have pulled in heading northbound. And, you know, if you listen to OJ's hypothetical confession, you know, and if, if you read the book, he claims he headed north on the alley, made a left, then made a right, and headed home that way. What OJ said his, his route was, if he did it, right? It's if he did it. All right, so let's get to what we have at Bundy. Now, the first officers arrived probably about 1201 to 1205 and investigators poured in after that you know tom lang of course mark Furman, van adder brad roberts what tom lang noticed and this was just after 4 a.m i think is when he got there there was footprints heading in a westward direction with five blood drops tailing west heading back to the alley where the Bronco was parked. Wherever it was dripping from, it was in motion, right? Of course, there were size 12 Bruno Mollies. You can see from the, the footprints that the assailant stopped at one point, turned around and looked back towards the bodies and then continued on. They did a stride analysis, which this is very interesting now. Um, it's a 30 inch distance between each footstep, right? So the stride analysis measures stride in footprints, 30 inches. So what that tells authorities is that the assailant walked away. He didn't even run. To walk away, I think you have some kind of familiarity with the area, which is another reason why I think O.J. parks the Bronco facing north in the alley. As we all know, those five blood drops matched O.J. Simpson's blood. There was blood drop on the gate of the rear exit of the residence, 
Just outside of the gate, there were two coins on the ground with blood around them, blood drops. And what Lang figured was the assailant pulled his keys out of his pocket and those coins fell out. In, in regards to what Heidstra said, and, I'm, and I said that I don't think it would, OJ would go that way, but then again, you're asking for a reasonable explanation of an unreasonable crime, right? So, you know, you can also say why would OJ take a big white Bronco at night uh, instead of a black Bentley? You know, if he was going to go do this, which I think maybe here's here's my pushback on that is maybe he took the white Bronco because Cato kind of messed up the plans to take the Bentley down there, and that if Cato can't see Cato can't see the Bronco from the residence because the Bronco's parked outside on the street, so you know um, maybe maybe that's why he decided to take the Bronco. Because, well, having to go to McDonald's with Cato kind of messes up my timeline. I got a flight to catch, so uh, let me go ahead and take the Bronco down there. Um, maybe not to commit murder. I don't think he went down there to kill her. You know, I think it escalated to that. But what we do know, like I said, those size 12 Bruno Mollies match the Bruno Mollies that OJ seen wearing in a few different pictures from a. a from a Buffalo Bills game that he was commentating. You can see O.J. wearing these, the Bruno Mollies. You know, that came out in the civil trial. And, um, you know, I've heard people push back on that, saying, well, that could be doctored. Well, here's the thing with that. Um, those pictures were taken, obviously, before the murders. They were published in a Buffalo Bills newsletter that was mailed out to Buffalo Bills fans some nine months prior to the murders to have doctored Bruno Molly's shoes on O.J. Simpson in a photo nine months before the murder is ridiculous. I think he made a few things up, a few small things up, but he tells you what happened. And, you know, and as you can see from that, you know, a lot of that to me is truthful. He takes the Bronco down to the alley with this Charlie guy, he gets out of the, the vehicle without Charlie, walks in through the back gate, and then he hears the back gate open up, which is interesting because for 25 years, I always assumed that Ronald Goldman came in through the front gate, but you know, you find out that he parks the car that he borrowed on the east side of the back alley, so maybe he was that comfortable. You know, I, I do know that, that the front gate had a malfunction on it, it wasn't fully functional. He comes in through the back gate, according to what O.J. says, and, and that Ron says, hey, I'm here to return some glasses. O.J. and Ron have some words. Uh, O.J. says that Ron gets into a karate stance, and O.J.'s like, oh, you think you can take me? There's a scuffle. Now, O.J. kind of just broadly says there's a scuffle and that Nicole ends up falling. And we do know from the lack of any blood on the bottom of Nicole's bare feet that she went down first. Now OJ does say that he grabs the knife from Charlie and then he blacks out. Um, when asked during the interview, did he drop the glove there? OJ says, well I must have because they found a glove there. Now see the problem with that is he's mixing a hypothetical scenario with reality. So he's saying hypothetically he dropped a glove there and it's mixed into it really was found there. So that there's a huge problem with this hypothetical. You know, he's he's almost speaking like it's not hypothetical. I saw this, I was there. Um, I saw Ron. Ron did this. Then he said he came to and he said there was blood everywhere. And him and Charlie take off. He's got to get rid of the clothes. I think he said he left his keys and I think his wallet in the pants. He had to go back and get them. And then he says he gets dropped off on the street behind him and cuts through the um, the neighbor's yard and then into his yard. And I think that's, I don't know that I, I believe that because the Bronco was parked in front of Rockingham and I would think if he's dropped off on the back street, then this Charlie guy would have to park the Bronco on the front 
and then take off in whatever vehicle he was in. So I think Charlie was totally made up. I think that OJ actually lucked out a few times that night. He lucked out that Alan Park was parked on the Ashford side on the phone with his boss when OJ was heading north on Rockingham. I think OJ hit the lights on the Bronco, pulled in there real slow and either hopped his gate or somehow opened it maybe and squeezed in there without making too much of a commotion all while Alan Park was on the Ashford side. Now if Alan Park was on the Rockingham side gate, I think he would have seen OJ pull up in the Bronco and then there would have to be some explanation for that. All right, we're here in front of OJ's old residence. It's been torn down since, but right now we're actually parked where the Bronco was parked that night. Uh, this is Ashford and Rockingham. Another stretch of luck was Lewis Carp. Now remember, Lewis Carp and Eva Stein lived just next door north of Nicole. His flight from LAX was supposed to land a half an hour sooner and it got delayed. So he got home at 1045. Now, if you theoretically do all the math, if his flight wasn't a half hour late, he would have pulled in to the alley at 1015. 1015 was when the dog was barking crazy. Um, I think Lewis Carp could have potentially seen the Bronco there if his flight wasn't late, you know. So there's two stretches of luck there, I think, that helped helped out in the case. Not to say that he would have been convicted anyway, but there was too much DNA. I mean, he had a DNA blood trail from Bundy, from the crime scene of Bundy, leaving Bundy, in his Bronco, up his driveway, in his walkway, through his foyer, up into his bedroom. Another key point, and, and, and I stress this when I talk about this to people, you know, that the whole idea of planting blood, you know, I can listen to that argument. I can listen to it if we're talking about Rockingham. But you got to remember that those five blood drops leaving the bodies, right? Alongside the left side of the size 12 Bruno Mollies, and by the way, OJ had a big nick in his middle finger on his left hand, that during the interrogation, he came up with three different reasons as to why he was bleeding. So it is acknowledged that he was bleeding. That's his blood. But remember those five blood drops walking away from the crime scene, heading west? Those were there when OJ was on a flight to Chicago and in Chicago. So in other words, there was no blood to withdraw from him from L.A. to plant on Bundy, which is why, during closing arguments, the defense, they didn't accuse the LAPD of planting those, you know. Um, there was questions about blood on the gate, on the back gate. Of course, questions about blood planting in the Bronco and um, at Rockingham. And to be fair, um, Philip Van Adder, one of the lead detectives, he was seen bringing OJ's files of blood to the Rockingham estate. Um, and Shapiro grilled him about that. I don't think it was planted. I think it was just a mistake. Now, the criminalist was there at Rockingham, but um, I don't think Van Adder should have brought that blood there just because of you know the scrutiny and, and how it came back to haunt him. But to be clear, the blood at Bundy was there before they withdrew any blood from OJ and I don't think you can get away from that you know um, I think OJ went there and I think what he described in his hypothetical uh, if you take away a few things here and there like Charlie and Charlie walking in after Ron Goldman walks in you take that away I think um, he tells you what happened I don't think that like I said I don't think that he was dropped off on the street behind him I think he actually pulled into Rockingham now what I think happened, OJ went over there, he's arguing with Nicole, Ron comes in, and during the scuffle, Nicole is hit on the top of the head, as we can see from the autopsy. She's knocked down, and then OJ and Ron square off, and uh, we've all seen the grisly shots. From that point, OJ walks back to the Bronco, bleeding, gets in the Bronco, drives it back to Rockingham, heading north on that alleyway. Hits the headlights, parks the Bronco really quiet because he knows that Park is on the other side, on the Ashford side of the property. OJ squeezes in through the gate or 
potentially hops it. I think he squeezes in. I don't think he opens it mechanically because I think it would make too much kind of noise. Then I think OJ walks on the south side of the house, which is a skinny little walkway where the AC unit is, hits the AC unit. Kato hears that thump and goes through the back, right? When he gets to the back, he realizes that the alarm is set. So now he has to head back to the front of the house. He heads back down to the front of the house and he merges on the Rockingham side of the driveway and crosses the entrance into the house where he can only disarm the alarm from the inside of the house. On the way to the airport, did the defendant say anything to you? Uh, yeah, a few times he repeated uh, how hot he was. Uh, two or three times he said, you know, man, it's hot. And I told him that he can turn the air conditioning on. And which did he? I remember hearing it come on, yes. He also had uh, the, the seat that he was sitting in. He also had the window down. Uh, a couple times, you know, he repeat, uh, repeated it doesn't pay to get dressed in a hurry or something like that, or I know I forgot something. I said that usually happens when you're going on a trip. Uh, asked me what time it was. Uh, Mr. Park, let me ask you something. How many times, well, he's on a narrative. If you don't mind, I'll ask him the next question. Excuse me, counsel, I thought we agreed we were gonna to talk to me. Thank you. Proceed. How many times did the defendant remark to you that he was hot? He said it pretty quick, right in a row, two or three times. And then after the air conditioning and the window were down, <clears throat> did he continue to repeat he was hot? Sustain or phrase question. After, did he remark on being hot again after the air conditioning was on and the window was down? Did he remark? Did he say it again? No. Do you recall what the weather was like that night? Uh, from what I remember, it was mild, having our normal June gloom, foggy nights. About what? About what was the temperature, if you recall? Uh, 68, 70 degrees, I don't know. Were you sweating? No, I wasn't. Were you hot? No. Uh, all of them said they were busy. So I walked into the terminal part and grabbed a luggage cart. Okay, and when, you, when you went to get the sky cap, did you bring the garment bag with you or did you leave it at the car? No, I set it on the ground. And when the defendant got out of the limousine, sir, could you observe him? Was there lighting there that you could see him? Yes. Did he get out of the car as soon as you pulled up to the terminal? I don't know if it was as soon as we got there. I know it was... I know it was pretty pretty quick after we pulled up. When you got out of the car after you parked there, did you see him out of the car? Did you see him get out of the car? Yeah, I'm, I opened the door. Oh, you opened the door for him? Yes. Okay. And then he got out? Yes. Could you tell whether or not he looked sweaty? Uh, sustain or phrase the question. Could you tell us how he looked? How did he appear? Uh, he seemed to be hot. Uh, and what did you see that made you believe that? He had a little bit of sweat on his forehead. So like I said, for me, June 12th and June 13th are the most interesting part of this case because that's the actual timeline. I mean, we're all going to come to our own conclusions about it, but um, that's what I, th I think happened. I think O.J. took that small bag with the potential murder weapon in it and whatever else was in it um, to the airport or dumped it somewhere else um, to get rid of it. Maybe even hit it on the property of Rockingham. I mean, we're never going to know that, but I do not believe there was a Charlie involved. I don't believe there was a second person there because I don't think somebody can hold their mud this long. You know, I don't think... Um, that some guy that OJ just barely casually knew wasn't going to open his mouth at this point.
especially for money or something, and say, hey, O.J. threatened me to go with him up there, and this is what happened. I think O.J. went there by himself, as he's done before. I mean, he watched that guy Keith and um, Nicole mess around in the Gretna greenhouse. He watched through the window. He's probably done it numerous times. But this night, you know, turned into something totally different. And it's a case that has continued to grow from old generation to new generation. There are countless documentaries and TV specials regarding this case. The best one that I've seen is the 30 for 30, OJ, Made in America, directed by Ezra Edelman. And it's a fair five-part documentary that uh, it tackles both sides, from before the murders to after the murders. And I think it's pretty objective in regards to the case. So I would recommend taking a look at that one. The American Crime Story that they did on FX, that started out okay, but I just felt that they got a few things wrong right off the rip. And it, it kind of... Kind of rubbed me the wrong way, I guess. Uh, the first thing would be when they found Nicole's body. It was found by a guy walking his dog, and he came across the Akita who was already at the front gate of Nicole's. And that's not how it went down. Nowhere near how it went down. You know, and I, I think they should have got that right, especially when you're going to open it up to that murder. You got to get that right. Secondly, when Alan Park picks up OJ. In the American Crime Story version, the limousine is down on the street. OJ walks down there and loads the limo there. And that couldn't be further away from what happened. Alan Park pulled into the premises, pulled into the driveway on Ashford, and was adjacent to OJ's front door, and they loaded the vehicle there. They, they really got that wrong. That's just inaccurate. I mean, there's little things like that that you just got to get right. So we're going to come to a close here on this 2S Horror Quarters podcast, another Ghost of L.A. edition. Shout out to Sammy Reese, whose song Ghosts of L.A. helped inspire these true crime episodes. So thank you, sir, for that. I appreciate everyone tuning in, and we'll see you next time. On June 12th, 1994, in the Brentwood section of West Los Angeles, two people were brutally slain in the front courtyard of 875 South Bundy Drive. One Ronald Lyle Goldman, age 25, and one Nicole Brown Simpson, age 35. Just after midnight on June 13, 1994, their bodies were discovered by a local resident. Los Angeles, already well established throughout history, would somehow be put on the map again. Okay, we're here at Pierce Brothers in Westlake Village at the gravesite of Ronald Lyle Goldman, who of course died on June 12th. 1994, and we wanted to come here and pay our respects to him. Much love, brother. We are at Ascension Cemetery uh, where Nicole Brown Simpson and her father are buried. Um, just here to pay our respects again. Such a tragic death.